La siguiente intervención supone un salto geográfico muy grande. Va a intervenir ahora Salma Damluji. Salma Damluji es arquitecto, es profesora de la American University de, de Beirut. Ha trabajado muchísimo durante toda su vida en restauración de arquitecturas de tierra, fundamentalmente, desde sus comienzos, cuando comenzó trabajando con Hassan Fati hasta la actualidad. Se ha convertido en una de las grandes expertas de esta materia y ahora mismo desarrolla su trabajo fundamentalmente en Yemen, que es de lo que, de lo que hablará a continuación. Thank you, Alessandro, whatever that meant. But I thought it was very strange. As I, I went down very quickly to grab a coffee, I was coming up to take the lift and I saw this beautiful carved arch piece of a mural that has been removed from somewhere and placed to the left. I don't know if you noticed it. Yeah? And I don't know what it is. It's a part of a wall or maybe it's, I don't think it's been redone. It's beautiful. Sorry? And I looked at it and I realized this was poetry in my language. So I started reading it. It's in Arabic. And I thought, how funny. I'm probably the only one here who can read this, appreciate the poetry. I'm not going to tell you what it says. It's love poetry. And it had some beautiful um, um, proverbs there. And of course, the emblem of the Aghlabid state, la ghaliba illallah, all around the frame. And I thought, isn't this odd? So many centuries later, here I am. I'm the only one who can read this, understand this. I'm a host, I'm a guest in Spain. I don't understand your language and you don't understand mine. <laughs> But my history is here. So there you are. And in fact, today, um, it only occurred to me that everything that we've heard over the last day, which has been a, a nice kind of huge bout of tranquilizer, as far as I'm concerned, as an architect who has to live and fight and struggle in this um, very small um, um, foot uh, of the world that we're trying to expand and fight. And what occurred to me is that, you know, all these expressions about classicism, vernacular, modern, contemporary, <laughs> all of this really in the end doesn't mean anything to us architects mm -hmm. because all we really want is to strive to work in um, the best um, um, form of truth that we find um, important in order to kind of entrust to generations or the knowledge we wish to impart with to our students in order for a better future, in fact, because I think the present is, is pretty depressing and pretty gloomy, especially where um, I am at the moment and um, where I've been working for a very long time, which is in the Middle East. So the area, um, incidentally, and quite ironically, that I'll be showing you today, is the same area from where the horseshoe arch comes from, the arch that you see in what we call uh, North African arch or architecture. It is from one of the earliest um, um, enclaves of urbanization in, in um, Uh, the region of the Arab world in Arabia that is Yemen. And um, I'll show you the map. It falls in the um, corner, southwest corner of Arabia. Why don't you tell us what the proverb said in the war? In the well, I have to be there to read it. I didn't memorize it. But it says, when the sun comes out on this beautiful house and the shadows um, play along Tatati. <laughs> I didn't write it down, but I thought it was very... It took me quite, quite a bit to um, be able to make it out. But I was expecting to find a Quranic verse or something. But the interesting thing, I have to tell you, the irony, is that um, it says... There's one part where it says, um, thank God for the grace of Islam. But I won't tell you where that is. <laughs> it doesn't get removed. Yeah, yeah. okay. I'll... I'll Yeah, I'll, I'll just read you a section of this introduction I have, which, um, uh, because we have 20 minutes and the time is very short, and it's almost unfair to show you um, the architecture or the culture of, of um, uh, a country that is ever so rich and probably the richest um, in the region at the moment. 
but um, as an architect, I have been concerned and engaged in unmapped towns and cities where I work with an architecture of complex depth and meaning as opposed to following a specific wave of an emerging or escalating trend of practice that may be more appealing, established, and publicized in the field. The decision to work with an unidentified or unqualified form of contemporary vernacular architecture, which is what I'm going to show you today, associated with the cities and urban culture of our region, the East, a region architecturally branded as the outside or the outside, outside the accepted norm of modern Western practice, is a difficult terrain to negotiate, let alone sustain. However, this different route that has been novel and equally rewarding provided a constant edge by virtue of the unfailing need, attraction, inspiration, and the knowledge it communicates and contains. It is the design paradigm of a higher order. Between the grand mosque, mosques of Abbasid Samarra, you know who the Abbasids are, they are the second Islamic dynasty and contemporary to the Umayyads who came and established the Islamic state or the Arab uh, rule in uh, Andalusia. Between the Grand Mosques of Abbasid Samarra, and the Mosque of Abbasid Samarra, incidentally, was the one that inspired um, the design of the Guggenheim in New York. I don't know if you're aware that the circular museum in New York was inspired by the ziggurat of the Samarra in, in Iraq. And this is because in the 50s, um, um, they were invited a, a number of architects, including Gropius, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, were invited, and Le Corbusier, were invited to visit Baghdad uh, to work on the master plan there. And that also included Doxiadis and Hassan Fathi, incidentally. So between the grand mosques of Abbasid Samarra and Umayyad Cordoba are two unmatched pillars, ultimate works of architecture to contemplate as lessons of ingenious design in a school of thought that is absent in our architectural curricula. Extant here is the present force of architecture, one that continues to speak to us. Extant here is the present force of architecture, one that continues to speak to us, hence the false premise of a general divide drawn in understanding the idea and concept of past and present. To be modern, you can hardly dismiss the dialect, the dialectic still at work with former or earlier works of architecture. The builder, the, I'm quoting here, the builder should know about Handasa. Handasa means geometry. Wrote Ibn Khaldun, who is um, the Tunisian um, sociologist who did the first uh, seminal piece of sociology and Ibn al-Haytham and Buzjani. They all dealt with building as a form of applied geometry. And here I'm talking about figures from the, um, of astronomers and mathematicians who worked in um, Iraq in the 10th century. Sina'a, which means craft, science, or art in Arabic, was applied to poetry, music, rhetoric, physicians, theologians, calligraphers, or peasants. All equally, they all equally require learning and practice, intelligence and skill in mastering the tools. Ibn Khaldun distinguishes between simple or complex knowledge, or information and science. He writes, in urban societies, any science, ilm, is a craft or profession, sina, with its own rules and systems that have to be studied. And I think this is the basis for a lot of what you'll be looking at and a lot of the culture and the heritage that you have also in Andalusia. This is a view of the landscape of Hadramut, the area that I've been working in since 1982. It's been a long time. 
And the area, uh, this is Yemen, and I, as I told you, it occupies the uh, southwest corner of Arabia. And um, Hadramut, the area I work in, is this vast uh, province. And this is also what I have uh, called in my um, second book on the country as the Valley of Mud Brick Architecture. It is a kingdom of mud brick architecture. Sana'a, the um, city and capital that we first saw in Pasolini's movie, if any of you have seen it, The Thousand and One Nights, is, is based here. But Pasolini also filmed in um, an area around there, and he also filmed in Hadramut and in Shibam. Now, I have been working in this area, which is, I first started working in Shibam and Terim, and that's when I was um, actually decided to do a PhD on architecture because it was the only way I could get into the country. The country was closed, it was like the Cuba of the Middle East, and it was socialist from when the British left in 1967 until um, 1990. And so the area I was just showing you previously, Do'an, this is the uh, close-up of Hadramut here. And this is the wadi where the cities of um, Tarim, <coughs> excuse me, and Shibam are based. And this is um, the area of Hadramut, of Do'an, the tributary of Wadi Hadramut. So the wadi is here, and it kind of um, then forks into uh, Do'an, and Do'an goes into two sections, what is known as the left bank and the right bank here. And these are the areas I've been working in since 2005 when I returned, and previously from 82 until 96, I was working in um, this region. And I did an extensive documentation about the mud brick architecture. Because we have a very short and has been elongated um, discussion, I'm just going to show you a film very quickly of uh, the making, the craft of making. Can we play the movie, please? This is Mukalla, the capital of Hadramut, it's on the coast. And it's built out of stone. And um, what distinguishes the country is that you have high-rise buildings up to five and six stories built either in stone, in this case, or in mud brick. And this is one of the mosques we restored. And these are the ladies still going out with their um, Halloween hats and building materials. This was put together from a series of photographs done by Roger uh, Mukherjee, who's a Lebanese photographer who came out with me in 2011. And he did this brilliant sequence, which he later put together for me. You can see that the sizes of brick in, in Yemen change and differ. The largest is 50 centimeters um, long and uh, 36 to 38 wide. And they're very thin, 5 to 6 centimeters thick. of construction is all based on load-bearing walls. So the thicknesses of the walls on the exterior would vary from 80 centimeters to 120 feet. And they're done in coising. And they're done in... Here, here. They're done in coising of um, uh, headers and stretches. And then the rest of the partition walls are done in single uh, brick arrangements. And these are just some views of other cities other than Shibam. This is Hajarin. This is inside Shibam. 
And the tall buildings of Shibam, the four and five uh, stories high, actually just have one entrance because they're a single family house. And this is the nura or the lime that is used for um, rendering the walls and damp proofing the walls as well. And it's used mostly in uh, wet areas and in mosques or houses and residences of the um, elite and wealthy. And these are some of the uh, humongous structures that were constructed out of sun-dried mud brick. And um, this is uh, Shibam, which if we have time, I'll show you. I'm going to, I think, move on because there's a lot of these um, images. And um, I'm going to take you to this first. We, we did several projects in um, various areas, but the first one I'm going to show you is um, Karin Majid. And I should tell you that the projects I'm showing today are ones that I did with, uh, in partnership with the Prince Klaus Fund in the Netherlands. And they have partnered with a foundation that I have set up in Yemen. I set it up in 2007 in order to work on the architecture of these um, towns and villages. And I said in the introduction that's been published in the catalog that uh, one is confronted as an architect with hundreds of these towns and villages that are <coughs> constructed in an architecture like the one you're looking at here and that have been neglected or abandoned as the case of this building called um, Qaran Majid and it's in, in the village of Qaran Majid and it is a, a fort that was previously used um, by the ruler of, of the area and, and since the collapse of the Sultanate and the tribal <coughs> regimes most of these uh, forts or palaces were deserted, and, but they still belong to the family. So we got some funding for it, and um, of course the first thing we did was to survey it, and it was in a pitiful state while it, it um, holds a very important, it's a very important landmark of the wadi since it's on top of the uh, rock that forks between, as I told you, the left and the right banks. And this is one of the entrances. This is the state the um, uh, Hassan or fort was in on the interior. And um, this is my um, site architect, the one I've worked with and trained. And these are um, the owners of the, or representatives of the owners of that um, fort. And the man on the left here is the builder who was helping me in uh, setting up the fort, and this is one of the um, descendants of the owners of the family. And when the work starts, of course, there are no roads um, where we can transport the building materials. So we use um, what we call beasts of burden, and um, to be less polite, uh, they're donkeys or mules. And, and first thing we have to do is reinforce the building, and after that we begin to work on the rendering. This was a case of pure um, rehabilitation and um, uh, restitution, as it were, as opposed to uh, reconstruction, which I'll show you in Shibam if we have the time. But uh, it's just to show you that on the interior we actually do the whole um, <coughs> surgery of reinforcing the buildings with um, new embedded type of uh, pillars that are uh, made out of stone, cylindrical uh, stone cylinders, uh, um, uh, columns, that are put together after incisions are created in the walls and the previous um, wooden pillars which had been rotted, removed. In this case, you can see we're putting in here a wooden uh, uh, reinforcement, wall reinforcement. And then you can see some views of the restoration of the roof, which is the most important area because this is the area. We have flood rains uh, in, in, um, in, in Hadramut, Yemen, because it's, it's affected by the monsoon uh, seasons in the subcontinent. And so we get the same type of um, gushing floods and spate flooding that takes place. And it's in those periods that a good number of these buildings collapsed. Don't forget, we're talking about buildings that were constructed in the last hundred years, the ones you're looking at, and not more than that. So talking about early uh, 20th, 20th century, sometimes middle 
uh, 20th century buildings. And then the whole um, restoration, if you like, uh, in situ and the uh, transport. There's a small film I'll, I'll show you again of, of Karin Majid when we get there. And the length they need to go on these um, lovely um, rickety scaffolding of theirs at, at humongous heights that no one would dream of going. And then scraping all the interiors <coughs> and then restoring both the ceilings and the walls with the application of the Noura uh, I showed you a bit earlier. Uh, this process, I mean, takes five minutes here, took us at least seven or eight months. And the application um, of Noura <coughs> takes, is, is done in five or six separate coats. This is some rendering we did before the building was then uh, completely painted um, in white and reserved. This is the second film, if we can show it. Or should I show it from here? Not working on my computer, I don't think so. No. Uh, no. I have to play it. He said he'll play it separately. Yes, yes. about the reconstruction of um, Karen Majid. This was in August 2014, I think. No, 13. I haven't been back since. No. This is a view of the wadi from, from the Hassan. The mixing of the mortar that is used. In this case, the rendering. All made out of clay, of course. <coughs> Cleaning up of the external walls. Reconstruction of a lot of the parapets. the rest of the town, which is actually quite dilapidated now. It's the Noura, the same lime I showed you, after it's been um, cooked and baked and then it's brought in. The builders of Hadramut are the best builders in the entire country, especially with the uh, Noura application. This Noura is exported to the rest of the country and still used everywhere, in Sana'a and in, in the north as well. And this shows the several coats that are used. No helmets, no boots, no safety regulations. 
They won't hear of it anyway. He's the director of, of our foundation, the Dawn Foundation, and the two architects who work with us. And this is after the building was completed. This just shows you how this architecture is, is, is so able to regenerate in that it looks absolutely clean, new, and modern once you've worked on it. And this is why this business of um, what some people look at being as conservation or restoration is completely beyond um, my remit. I don't even know how to go about conservation. All I know is that we are learning from these builders and they are the ones who run the show, really, in instructing us what they need and what they require. And we tell them how we don't want the use of any other material other than the actual traditional materials that were originally used. Because today they use all sorts of steel and, and iron rods for reinforcement and concrete, of course. And, and I simply refuse um, any of that material. And so once they get back into the act, they are extremely grateful that someone appreciates. OK, the yellow card has come up. So I think what I'm going to do is this is what it looks like after it's been restored. I'm just going to go back very quickly and um, take you to um, Well, I've stopped it from my end, at least. Just take you very quickly to Shibam, so you know what we're talking about, and then I'll leave you. And um, this is the, the city that was called, or was uh, termed by um, <coughs> Freya Stark in the early part of the 20th century, British Traveller, as the Manhattan of the desert. Of course, it was built centuries before New York, but that doesn't matter. Manhattan is the point of reference. It's constructed out of um, sun-dried mud brick. This is a plan um, of the city with the surrounding wall. And it's got um, something like just under 400 houses. And the number hasn't changed. This is how, the main. How big is the, how big is the town? Oh, how you got me there. I forgot. But I have it somewhere. So I'll check it for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I have to be exact. I'll just get back and t give you the exact dimensions. I actually did my PhD on, on this city, so <laughs> once it's all published, it gets out of my, disappears from my mind. But you can see that essentially it, it had just one main entrance. This city was the commercial capital of Hadramut because Hadramut was... Um, on the incense route, on the main franc incense route. And franc incense was provided from Yemen all the way to Rome and to Byzantium on, on camels via Petra and, and um, uh, thereafter Istanbul, etc. And it still produces franc incense to this day. And Shibam was, also, was the commercial capital and it was also known as the yellow city because of the color of grains uh, that, that were produced and brought to the town. That's the main entrance and cafe. And um, all the nice um, dishes that they have on the ceiling. This is a view of the, um, from the house that we uh, were working on from the second main square in the city, which is known as the um, 
a square of Al Mansur because the mosque you're looking at on the left hand side there is the only building constructed out of sun dried mud brick. And this is because it was built in the tradition of the Abbasid uh, buildings in Iraq, in Baghdad in particular, therefore named after the Caliph Al Mansur. And, um, carries his name. Of course, it's been reconstructed. And uh, we're looking at the southwest, at the, sorry, northwest here uh, view of the city. And one of the houses that had, um, we worked on two houses, one that had collapsed, which is identified as um, 25D here. And this is the mosque I was just showing you, and that's the square. And you can see that sections of this house had collapsed and the owners um, were living in the two bottom floors when we first went to visit. And um, they thought that all they needed to do was to restore the upper houses, the upper floors and in order to and reconstruct them. We initially got them the funding based on this and the advice that we got from their builders. But after I got the money and I went to visit, I had second thoughts and I brought in the builder I work with from Terim. And this is the second house that had suffered uh, some cracks due to the collapse here from the flooding. Uh, this is a plan of the first house, the, the one that I showed you, uh, sections of which had collapsed. This is the entrance. And you f see that the um, core, you can see the core here of the um, load-bearing walls and then the partitions and the main, um, staircase area, this one here, is also built in the same um, mid-mac type and, and with this sturdy core that is part of the um, um, structure of the load-bearing structure. And then we continue until we get, there are no courtyards and the terraces serve as courtyards. And this is a small house by comparison to the other houses, but this is the Shibami builder we had and they were just showing me the devastated state of affairs on the interior. I'm just going to go very slowly. However, after my builders came from Terim, they said there is no way we can reconstruct this. It has to be pulled down and built again. <laughs> so, um, after a lot of toing and froing, this is exactly what we did. So I'm just going to go through these very quickly to show you how these buildings get rebuilt. Here we are, completely new, reconstructed building. And this is the second house which um, needed some, that's the lady owner and the restoration of that. And thank you. Sorry it took so long.